welcome to Online Church at Baker Memorial United Methodist Church in St. Charles. I'm Pastor Kim Neese. On behalf of myself and Pastor Mary Zajek, we welcome you whether you are right here in St. Charles or maybe in another state or even in another country. We are here as a community worshiping together. With that, Pastor Mary Zajak will be bringing our message today with our second week in our sermon series called New Times with Us. Thank you to uh, Pam Turup, who is our liturgist this week, as well as Sam Wyatt and Mary Beth Kernot, who are our musicians. Thank you, all of you, for using your gifts, talents, and abilities to be able to bring us worship today. We also give a shout out to Rob Hale, Mandy Hale, and Michelle Claney for all the behind the scenes they do each and every week. Well, being part of Baker Memorial United Methodist Church means really being able to be part of the community and helping others as well as celebrating with others. And this week we are celebrating the baptism that was last week in person of Sophia Grace Hartney. Congratulations to the Hartney family, and we are excited for you to be part of the Baker United Methodist Church family as you raise Sophia here. We very much encourage people to grow in their faith, and one way we do that is through recharge. So we have two new adult opportunities that are available for you. One is nature, our first way of knowing God, and the other is five cups of coffee. Come be part of that at 1030 a.m. Also, we have a mission trip. The Baker youth have planned this and have now opened it up to the entire congregation today. We would love for you to be part of that. We're going to Pawnee, Illinois, which is the Midwest Mission Distribution Center, whereas this weekend I just got word that they are sending money as well as food, rice bags, to Ukraine, and they're doing that this May. So we are hoping to be able to be part of a worldwide help for the Ukraine or some others that are very much in need for human, humanitarian relief. So if you'd like to be part of that mission trip, you can do so at tinyurl.com, Baker Youth Mission Trip. There are a limited amount of spots, so it's first come, first serve. On May 4th, we are celebrating our next Faith, Food, and Fun, and the we are going to be celebrating Cinco de Mayo, and this will be a great intergenerational experience for everyone, and it's Mexican-inspired with some tacos, a piñata, and who knows might, what might come out of those that we'll be able to work on as a craft together. Then on Sunday, May 15th at 7.30 a.m., we're calling all the men to the men's breakfast. This is an opportunity for you to be in community with one another, to have a devotion that's led by Mark Armstrong, as well as have a wonderful breakfast. We believe in helping others, and one way that we do that and that you can do that is by being part of the blood drive that is on May 19th from 2.30 to 6.30 and that is a way for you to really help another person in life that really needs blood. And you can sign up at tinyurl.com, Baker Blood Drive. Well, we had a gentleman at our church that was there for many years named B.G. Gross, and he had such a passion for people in education that he has left behind a scholarship for those that are going to school. So anyone who is entering their bachelor's or master's or doctorate schooling, you may go ahead and apply for a scholarship at tinyurl.com bggross. Those applications are due by May 29th, and we encourage all people to be there that apply that receive the scholarships to be in person to receive those on June 12th. Speaking of June 12th, one of the days you will be able to stay for VBS. We have VBS for all ages this year. It's an intergenerational event. So all children need to be accompanied by adults, but all adults do not need to be accompanied by children. We have five days that are available for you. So on June 5th and June 12th, we will stay right after church from 1030 to 12. And then on June 7th, 14th, and 16th, it's going to be in the evenings from 530 to 7. Food will be involved in each and every one. In fact, we're going to have a food truck. We're going to have a milk ice truck. It is going to be amazing. And the cost is only $10 per person. And this is going to be a great experience. The food truck will be an extra fee. 
Now you can sign up at tinyurl.com VBS for all 22. Our last announcement today is a way that you can make a difference in what is happening in Ukraine. We want you to be part of the Bishop's Appeal. Each and every year, Pastor Mary and I and several of our leaders go to the annual conference and the Bishop always has an appeal. And this year it is for Ukrainian relief. So all of that that is donated will go there. You can go to the tinyurl.com, Baker UMC Giving, go to the drop down screen and you can pick the Bishop's Appeal. Or you can just go right now with your phone if you're on your TV and go ahead and click that QR code and it will bring you to that same site. Again, you will just click down. In addition, on that site is the opportunity for you to give your weekly giving or donation or tithe. And we want to thank you so much for each and every one who donates their um, tithes each and every week. Well, it's at this time now that if you have a candle at your home, We'll ask you to go ahead and get that and a lighter and we'll light those together. Would you please pray with me? Oh, gracious God, we come before you today just thanking you for your son, Jesus Christ, for us celebrating Easter just a couple weeks ago that we are still in this Easter tide where we can celebrate and be renewed by the resurrection. And we are just asking that you open our hearts and our minds today as we listen to the word through scripture, listen to the word through a message, through singing, and being in community. Take us to a new place in our faith. We thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's children said, Amen. Let's continue to worship now as we sing the song, Morning Star, How Fair and Bright. It will be singing verses 1 and 3. You may do that in any way that you feel in your home. Let's continue to worship. A reading from the book of Acts, chapter 9, verses 1 through 20. Meanwhile, Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. 
Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight, and neither ate nor drank. Now, there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananus. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananus. He answered, Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Street, and at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananus come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananus answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananus went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on your way here has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus. And immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. This is the word for all people. Thanks be to God. Please pray with me. Living Lord, our desire is to follow you into newness of life so that your desire for this world might be brought closer to fulfillment. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and guide us on your way. In Christ and by your Spirit we pray. Amen. Happy Easter! As I mentioned last week, this is still the season of Easter in the church. In fact, that's going to be true all the way through Memorial Day. So we're going to continue to use this Easter call and response. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Those are important words because they celebrate the good news of Easter and also because they either cause us to remember what we already know about Christ or they cause us to ask ourselves the important question, how can I know that he is risen indeed? Both reactions are important. One affirms faith and the other can help us move towards faith. On that first Easter Sunday morning, the women came back from the tomb with words of joy. Christ is risen just like he said. And the disciples asked themselves, how can we possibly know that what you're saying is true? The answer to their question came quickly because Jesus came to them and revealed to them that he was alive. And Jesus came back many times so that those original disciples had no doubt that Christ was risen indeed. But then Jesus ascended into heaven and appeared in human form no more. After the ascension of Jesus, the question became harder to answer. How can I know that Jesus is risen indeed? One answer to that question is told in our passage about the conversion of Saul, who is also known by the name Paul. Now, just to get this out of the way, I want to clear up some confusion right away about the Apostle Paul's name. His name wasn't changed by God from Saul to Paul, even though that is a popular story that is sometimes told. Rather, much like some of my friends with non-English names, sometimes take on English names to make it easier for other people to call them by name, Saul simply had two names. So Saul is Paul and Paul is Saul. Both names are used for the same man in the New Testament. Saul is often used with more fully Jewish crowds and Paul, might be more commonly used among the Gentiles. As we heard, the story of Saul's conversion went like this. He started out on the road to Damascus thinking everyone who followed Jesus was completely wrong. 
Jesus had not risen from the dead, and he wasn't the Messiah of God. A little over a week later, he was convinced that Christ had risen indeed and became one of the most faithful evangelists in the early Christian church. He went from disbelief to unshakable belief. But how did he know? The passage we read today happened quite a while after the Spirit-filled days around Pentecost when thousands of people discovered the resurrection of Christ. It's not clear how long after those early days, but it seems likely that it was years. It was long enough for a deep division to grow between the Jewish people who followed Jesus and those who rejected him completely. It was long enough for a substantial group of Jesus followers to get established far away from Jerusalem, 135 miles northeast in Damascus. It was long enough and conflicted enough that the high priest at the temple was willing to give this faithful and energetic man named Saul letters that would allow him to arrest followers in Damascus and bring them back to Jerusalem to be detained, put on trial, and who knows, maybe even stoned to death like the disciple Stephen had been stoned after preaching about Jesus. Saul got his letters and he set out on the long walk to Damascus with, Damascus with his team. And as we imagine them on their journey, we need to remember that these were all strong believers in God. They kept the Jewish laws to the letter and more. They surely engaged in their daily prayer practices and studied the scriptures as they went. But then, just as they got near Damascus, there was a bright light and a loud sound. Everybody saw the light and heard the sound, but only the leader of this group experienced it in full. Saul came person to person with the risen Christ. Luke tells us that he fell to the ground and was blinded. What the others heard as a sound, he heard as a voice speaking directly to him. And the voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul answered, who are you, Lord? We notice that Saul used the word Lord, but not as a title for Christ like Christians do throughout the New Testament. Lord is also a generic term of respect for someone of a higher power than yourself. So Saul knew this was a higher power addressing him, but he was utterly confused as to who would say such a thing. I appreciate a comment N.T. Wright, who's a well-known Christian scholar, made about this moment. He observed that there may never have been a more confusing moment in Saul's life. The voice seemed like the voice of God, but from Saul's perspective, it couldn't be the voice of God because Saul didn't think he was persecuting God. He thought he was being zealously faithful. Saul was so confused that he had to ask, Who are you, Lord? Imagine what it would have felt like for Saul to hear the divine voice say, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Get up, enter the city, and you'll be told what to do. Just take a moment. Let yourself feel the, the fear desperation, and the regret that Saul must have felt. Saul had calmly watched the stoning of Stephen after Stephen preached about Jesus. And Saul was on his way to find more people who needed to be detained because of what they believed about this very man named Jesus who had just spoken to him. It's hard to imagine the challenge of that moment when all of Saul's beliefs were shattered. Encountering Christ can be very painful. Saul's team helped him up, and then they led the one who had been leading them into the city to rest. The scripture says that Saul neither ate nor drank, but who could after that experience? My guess is that he would have spent those waiting days praying fervently for understanding and for mercy. Meanwhile, on the other side of town, Ananias also received a visit from Jesus. Again, the visit wasn't in person. It was in a vision. And Jesus gave him a mission. Go find Saul. Heal him, teach him, and prepare him for a new mission in my name. Can you imagine hearing that message. 
healing Saul? That would make Ananias an outcast in his community at best, or a leading cause of their arrest at worst. It was dangerous. Saul had asked, who are you? But Ananias knew it was Jesus, so he asked a different question. Do you really mean that man named Saul who's so cruel? Am I hearing you right? And Jesus confirmed, Saul indeed was the man. The persecutor was being called into service for Jesus. He would take the gospel to the Gentiles and kings and to the people of Israel as well. It is a testimony to just how impactful that encounter with Jesus was for Ananias, that he called Saul Brother Saul when he went to heal him. And Saul's baptism on the day that he was healed is a testimony to just how impactful this encounter with Jesus and this healing by Ananias was for Saul. Turns out that encountering Jesus changes the person. So Saul started testifying that Christ was risen indeed. We don't know what happened with Ananias. He isn't mentioned again, but he certainly could have testified that Jesus is here with us and still working extraordinary miracles. The story of Saul, also known as Paul, becomes a main focus for the rest of the New Testament. He went on to build up the body of Christ among Jewish and non-Jewish people. He started numerous churches. He testified to kings and governors and many others in civic leadership. All that Jesus had said would happen did, in fact, happen. I only wish that the very next sentence out of my mouth could be words of certainty saying that everyone could encounter the risen Christ in the same way for themselves. I really wish I could just say with confidence that Paul's transformation is the model for how people come to believe in Christ and that we should hope that Christ is going to stop every tyrant in their tracks. But I can't say that, because that simply doesn't seem to be true. I do believe that as Paul writes in the book of Philippians, every knee will eventually bend and every person will bow and call Christ Lord. But for many of us, if not most of us, it seems like that's not going to happen until eternity. So then back to our opening observation about our Easter call and response. For some of us, it's an affirmation. For others of us, it opens the question, how can I know that he is risen indeed? In my experience, there are many paths to this kind of faith certainty. Some people who are raised up from childhood in a faithful, healthy congregation never experience a doubt. They are formed in faith so young, and they are surrounded by people of faith for so long that they just know it's true. What a beautiful faith story that is, a beautiful witness to the importance of the church. And I think it's actually a testimony to the understanding that a whole new era began with the resurrection of Christ. The kingdom of God is here on earth, and some people are in fact blessed to live in it almost completely. However, as we observed last week when we started this Easter sermon series I've called New Times, the transformation of the earth into the kingdom of God is not yet complete. We have to pray for it to come more fully each week when we pray the line in the Lord's Prayer, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Old times and new times overlap in this world, and while a lot of people have found faith, many more have not. So how do people come to know that Christ is risen indeed. Each person's story is unique. A few people I know would say that they, like Saul and Ananias, had a spiritual encounter with the risen Christ that shattered their old understanding and gave them a new understanding and a new mission. More people I know would say that they had a spiritual experience, perhaps a prayer or in the midst of their lives, not so much an encounter with Jesus himself, but an experience of the Holy Spirit who brought them a deep sense of assurance so that they had no doubt. Those often, by the way, came after years, even decades, of trusting deeply in Christ already. Probably, however, most people that I know came to faith understanding through the witness of other people and actually through the, the mission of their local church. People I know saw good work being done through a local congregation and asked why. And someone told them it was because we understand that we are to serve Christ here, near, and far away by loving our neighbors as ourselves. 
Many people I know discovered that the church is a place where you can ask other people what convinced them that Christ is risen indeed. And while the answers are different across the congregation, often one person's answer would convince them. People I know came to faith in Christ when they participated in a small group where spiritual practices were built up and questions could be answered, as well as lessons learned in the midst of life being shared. Many people I know came to be able to say that Christ is risen indeed by first saying, hmm, that person seems to know Christ is risen, so maybe I can too. And then, I hope Christ is risen. And then, I think he is risen indeed. And finally, surely he must be risen indeed. That's the only thing that makes sense in this new world where the old ways actually still exist. I hadn't actually intended to take this direction of faith growth when I started studying for the sermon this week, but I was struck by something I hadn't noticed before as I read and prayed for this sermon. The story of Saul's conversion from Jesus rejecter to Jesus follower is actually told three times in the book of Acts. And each time it is to a different audience who doubted Saul's faith. Saul also told his story in a number of the letters he wrote to the churches he started or he shepherded. In fact, this story of Saul's experience may be the most frequently told story in the entire Bible after the resurrection. That telling and retelling may have felt like a burden for Paul because his faithfulness was repeatedly doubted, but it was a powerful tool in the hands of Christ. Telling and telling again brought many to that first step of their faith. If he believes, why can't I? If he's so convinced that he's changed his life completely, perhaps just maybe Christ is risen indeed. My challenge to you as we continue to live in these transitional new times, my challenge is to know your own story. I'm not asking you to go out and tell strangers on the street unless, of course, you've been called to be an evangelist. I'm not even asking you to tell your family. Hopefully they already know. What I'm suggesting is that you reflect on your story so that you can be ready to tell it when somebody asks you. Because it turns out that telling and retelling our stories is a powerful tool in the hands of Christ. Few people have Saul's story, but I believe that all of us have an important story for somebody to hear. So figure out your own faith story and be ready to share it when you hear the question asked. Amen.
Prayer is in a very important part of our worship service and we have a space for you online to be able to give your prayer requests. So if you go to bakermemorialchurch.org, you can go to the online church and you can see there where you can give your prayer request. They matter to us and it's one way that we can connect spiritually with you. In addition, we want to know that you were in worship today. So go ahead and give your attendance on that same link. As in addition to that, we thank those who have so generously given of offering. There is an offering online giving section there as well. Or you can send checks in to 307 Cedar Avenue, St. Charles, Illinois, 60174. Let's join together in prayer now. Today we come praising you, God, as the Holy One. You are the one who walks beside us the one who directs and guides us, encourages us, transforms us, restores us, and helps us to be renewed day after day. It's when we recognize these things in our lives that we can live more fully. We celebrate those who have had major accomplishments. We take a moment to pause to lift those up. We give praise for our day guest who was homeless last week and now has his own apartment to call home. We praise you for those who had educational, military, and career celebrations. We celebrate with those who have another day of sobriety and for those who are seeking treatments. We give thanks for those in this congregation at Baker Memorial United Methodist Church who serve and walk alongside others with encouragement, whether it be through words, actions, and the love all around with compassion. And we thank you for each breath that we take each and every day. May those breaths give you praise for the experiences that we live. Lead us and open our eyes to not be blinded by the everyday interferences, injustices, and distractions of life. When there are family or other relational concerns, we seek your strength, your protection, and your understanding. When we're grieving the physical, emotional, and mental losses in our lives, we seek your comfort, your care, and your everlasting love. Today, we intercede on behalf of so many of our friends who are seeking affordable long-term housing. The needs are many, but the places are few. For those entering pal palliative care, those continuing in hospice, having surgeries and procedures, and dealing with so many different illnesses that take a toll on one's body, mind, and soul, we seek your healing touch in hope of everlasting life where all is made new. Each caregiver is such a blessing who walks both side each person, and this also can be hard times, so give them rest and renew them with strength. We continue to pray for world peace and the war that seems to be expanding. We pray for a resurgence of integrity, honesty, health, restoration, unity, food, justice. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and let us proclaim your name as renewed people living in new times. We lift all of this up in Jesus' name, the one who gives us resurrected life. Amen. Well, it's at this time that we will listen to some beautiful music, but as we end our worship, we want you to be reminded to go and think about the new times in your resurrected life. Go with a sense of peace. In the name of the Creator, Savior, and Sustainer, have a blessed week. We look forward to seeing you right back here next Sunday. Bye-bye.